Okay. Right. Yeah, them, everyone just plug your ears if it's like, please. See right now. All squint at once. I mean, wait. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Yeah. We have a couple seats up front if anyone wants to. Yeah, I've got like four. We're not going to call on anybody if you're like one of those people who's like wanting to hide. Like. Not me. Yeah. Just you guys because we assume you, you're comfortable. They can't control me. <laughs> okay. They can't control me. Put your stuff in. Okay. Mic. You get a mic. <laughs> okay. We're probably good on time. They're shutting doors. Okay. I'm not sure this guy works here. I'll stand over here. Okay. Are you going to change the slides? Or you want me to? Either one of us. Okay, can everybody hear me? You're, okay, I got thumbs up. What about you? Me, can you hear me? Okay, okay. Well, hello, everyone. Did everybody enjoy the keynote? I will personally start by saying I relate to these issues. Um, I was diagnosed with OCD when I was probably 11 or 12. I have a very anxious mind. Um, I overcame my OCD through years of hard work, uh, but I still have a very anxious mindset. That's just how I am. So if I start talking really fast, probably just a little wired. Um, this is my first time speaking uh, at a professional conference uh, and at a B-Sides. This is our fourth year at this B-Sides, and this is yeah. like the fourth B-Sides here, I think. Is it right? the, yeah, I think, uh... I think this is their fourth. So uh, we're both really happy to be here. Um, I wanted to speak, uh, and besides means a lot to me because I'm about four years into my career, and I felt like it was about time I made myself get up here and talk. Um, so, yeah, today we're going to talk about information security, tools of the trade. Um, this is a very green talk, so um, this is kind of aimed for entry-level people. Uh, it's a talk I would have loved to have gone to at my first conference because I showed up and read all the talks, and I was like, I don't know what any of these things are or where I should be. So this is for the people that are new. Mm -hmm. It is basically the greenest of green talks, minus uh, the whole, well, if you're brand new, there are some things that may not be understood, but they are in the slides for that, that reason. They're typical use cases, things like that, to get started. Um, but first, you know, we'll kick off. I'm Tara, wink. Um, I am married to Jason Smith, but I'm Tara Wink. Um, <laughs> I have a background in physics. I did not go to college for computer science uh, or anything IT related. Uh, I started out in physics. I graduated and was like, it's great, I got a physics degree. What do I want to do with this? Physics factory. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was fortunate enough to have had um, a job in security, um, probably like my sophomore year of college, which kind of you know, sparked my interest in, you know, how do computers talk to each other and kind of learning about packet captures. Um, but that didn't really keep my interest because I was in physics, so I didn't really hold all that information in until after I graduated and got a job at the state of Kentucky. Um, I had a kind of general security role there. Um, they didn't really know what they hired me to do. They just knew they needed a security person, and I fit that box. <laughs> so my first year of work was kind of find what you need to do here to make the environment secure. Um, and so that was kind of fun. Uh, it was kind of do what you want to do. Um, and I picked up testing web applications, uh, which kind of led me into my next job, which was pen testing. Um, I did pen testing for about a year and a half. I really enjoyed that. Uh, it was fascinating work. Uh, but then I switched over, and now I do more blue team stuff. I work for a healthcare company uh, called Change Healthcare, and I work on the SOC team there. I'm the level three analyst, and so I have a little bit of both worlds. But Yeah, I've basically. mostly been blue team. So I, I got a physics degree as well. I graduated and became a sanitation engineer immediately. And when I say that, I literally had a degree, and I went to go work at the local park as a garbage man. Um, I got, yeah, yeah, I got picked up uh, by an old professor who was like, hey, you should parse all this data. You were great at it with me and you worked with me, so come work for me. And the data was PCAPs, 
and that's history. Um, I've now worked for several uh, state and federal agencies. I currently work with Cisco ATA. Uh, it's kind of their MSS service offering that they have. Uh, recently, uh, you know, quit from FireEye. Uh, not for any kind of bad reasons. I had the greatest team ever. In fact, my my old boss is speaking at the end of the today, Chris Sanders, who you know wrote Practical Back and House, all that stuff. Great guy, and the rest of the team was just as great. Um, but now my new Cisco team, also awesome. Uh, Co-authored Applied Network Security Monitoring with Chris. Um, again, I started in Bowling Green, like where Tara kind of started with the Cyber Defense Lab. I was actually across the hallway from Tara at a different company, and we kind of worked together contract-wise. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm married to Tara. Hello. So before we get started, again, we kind of mentioned this is a green room talk. Um, it's for very entry-level people. Um, it's for people that are new to information security. Um, is this anyone's first B-sides? That's awesome. Is anyone here just like brand new to information security? Awesome. Okay. Is anyone like in an IT job, but you're like wanting to transition to the security group? Okay. Yeah, we got a couple of people everywhere. Okay. So. This is a productive audience then good talk okay anyone recently graduated and you're here because you're like hoping to land a job somewhere no hands really okay techie high schoolers kind of, yeah it's... any techie high schoolers um no oh the one techie high schooler okay okay <laughs> okay so so yeah it's it's basically it's also to give if you like to mentor and you just really like to hear like other ways of doing things this may not be a better way uh, but hopefully it's at least going to be a slightly different way uh, that you can kind of take it away and maybe show some other people. Uh, we like to mentor a lot of people up in Bowling Green and here in Nashville uh, and try to pull in different people. Uh, if they are interested, you know, high schoolers who think, well, there's not really anything. I don't know what to do in college. I just know I have to go. Or like, well, you know, there are alternatives and things you can do while in college, which, uh, you know, we go into in this talk. Uh, not targeted at people who are like, oh, that's not the right way to, to teach people, blah, blah. You know, that can be told afterwards. You know, we can fix this up as needed after. But uh, for the most part, if you're like, this is not advanced enough, it's probably because you are too advanced and uh, the talk probably isn't geared for you. Yep. So leave now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, so. Yeah. So what we're talking about today is operations in security. Uh, we won't really talk much about compliance or administration, um, but for the sake of knowing, compliance is really why we all have jobs. There are laws made that say that companies have to do the security stuff, and so what we do is uh, over time some guys or some gals like, hey, we should probably actually do operational security and monitor stuff or maybe do some sort of vulnerability testing or pen testing. And so those jobs occur, but rarely were those jobs the laws made. So compliance is, is kind of where things uh, start from a legal perspective and where a lot of companies really get into gear on getting security operations going right. afterwards. It's more of like your auditing group. So mm -hmm. if you want to be an auditor and go in and say, hey, you know, how well are you, is this company doing with security? That would be a compliance job. You'd be yeah. in, in an auditing role. So what we talk about today isn't the limit to security, in case you're interested. There are also right. a lot of compliance jobs more than most jobs actually there are more compliance gigs maybe not here necessarily but uh, you know I lived in Charleston for instance and in just uh, the, the organization I work with there they had 200 auditors in one office uh, so there are a lot of auditing positions but uh, there's also administration won't talk about that much they basically keep things going they're not always super technical but they're always super needed um, so how do you learn this stuff basically we always recommend that you know somebody else who's trying to learn this stuff or know somebody who already does the stuff. Uh, it's always very productive if you can go on and not learn the stuff on your own because it's easy to fall off the wagon if you're new to it. It may seem overly complicated, overly technical, but if you have somebody else, they may say, oh, well, this is actually how this is done. Or you may be able to help them say, well, it's not as hard as you think. Let's get the result and then we can figure out, you know, the process and things like that. Um, we also are trying to say that everything we show here is all free. Uh, it doesn't cost money to learn this stuff. Uh, there are costly ways of doing it, but from your house, you can do all this stuff for free. Right. So the main goal is to talk about the operations team, what operations people do, and if you wanted to get started in that role, what are things you can do for free at home to kind of get yourself started um, as an entry-level person? So first, we talk about operations. Um, mainly, we're going to talk red team and blue team stuff. 
Uh, red team are the hacker types and blue team are the surveillance types. Talk more in detail about those. Um, so red team. Um, so we have here basically a job description. If anybody has been researching for a job lately, you've probably ran through a million job descriptions. They all look like this. You can't read that because you zone out and they all ask for you to know a million different things. Um, and it's kind of hard to think just by reading a job description, like, what would my actual day-to-day -day look like? Like, what does this person actually do? Because they really just want you to do everything. Right. The process is the same for no matter what level of experience you are. Generally, if you're looking for a new job, you come across a bunch of stuff. And if you are timid, you're probably like, I don't actually know all of this stuff. This is, uh, I feel like maybe I should be farther. And that's where a lot of... Uh, um, Oh, what's the syndrome? Imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. syndrome. Which was that's, mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's where a lot know. of that comes from, is that you have big listings like this, and they seem impossibly hard to actually get to learn. But in reality... The real job. What does a pen tester do? Lots of different stuff. Uh, mainly, you test for vulnerabilities. You try to exploit them. Uh, you try to help companies figure out how to resolve those issues that you found. Uh, we're exploitable, so you're helping companies basically protect their environment. Um, you do that. Uh, there's also social engineering, um, so everyone's heard of, you know, fake calling, trying to get passwords from people, or sending phishing emails. Um, so there's lots of social engineering events that you can do as a pen tester. Um, you make malware, of course, because you're trying to make exploits to exploit things. Uh, so there's lots of, like, if you like coding and, you know, you're really into figuring out how exploits work and you like coding, probably a job you'll really enjoy. And you do lots of reporting. About half the time in a pen testing job, you're going to do your tests and then you're going to spend a solid amount of time writing reports. If you hate technical writing, there's your warning. <laughs> so blue team, I love network security monitoring, uh, obviously. Um, we do network security monitoring, which is, you know, monitoring uh, network traffic going to and from different hosts and different networks and all kinds of good stuff, bad guys, good guys. We do host monitoring, which is uh, usually a subset of, of that when, so once we find bad stuff. Uh, host monitoring is, you know, going to the actual, uh, you know, host device or something like that, maybe pulling logs, or maybe you already send them to some other searching tool. Uh, a lot of surveillance type stuff. Uh, we track bad guys and uh, we track good guys alike, friendly uh, detection uh, or friendly acid detection uh, and uh, also tracking bad guys. Uh, we analyze malware sometimes. Uh, so there are dedicated people to analyzing malware. Uh, there are dedicated people for network security monitoring. There are dedicated people for basically each one of these things. Uh, and the same can go for red team work as well. That in some, some gigs, you know, you may be dedicated more towards one aspect of those and in blue team gigs, you may be dedicated to one, you know, one aspect of these. Um, and some people are just, uh, you know, jack of all trades uh, that do a lot of different things. So, so infosec <laughs> is actually quite easy and, and fun, right? You, there's like ten things at most you can do red team and blue team, right? Well, it's actually a, a few different things. There are a lot of tools involved. It's not just five tools for one and five tools for the other. Uh, and, and it may look like you have to learn all this stuff, and this is just that job description all over again. Uh, and so it's, it's a little rough. Uh, but in reality, you know, this, this actually isn't too bad. Um, so essentially when you start out, things are a mile wide and an inch deep, especially if you don't have a focus on what you like. Right. A lot of people don't already know what they like. I mean, you've been in red team, blue team, and administration. I'm still figuring out what I like, so. All right, and I think that's the idea is that if you, if you make a career out of this, that's what you're doing. The good news is that once you get past this learning curve right here, which is pretty difficult to do, it's like you start learning more stuff than ever, quicker than ever, and it's of more impact than ever, and these jobs start to look more obvious than ever, and things aren't so bad, and before you know it, a few years later, you're already coasting up here at the top, and it's, it's kind of easy street. And then some people will go a little bit farther, and they go crazy about analyzing malware. And, and maybe if you're you know, a red team person, you're, you're actually doing all these bug bounties and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so you can make it as fun as you want, as difficult as you want. But know that there is a learning curve no matter what you do, and you'll get past it. It's just Absolutely. a matter of time. So before we go forward, we're going to talk about some tools, and we just want to 
warn everybody, you know, if you want to set up these tools and play with them at home, we highly recommend it, but we just advise a lot of caution. Please don't do this on public networks mm -hmm. or anything that doesn't belong to you or anything that you do not have explicit permission to test. It's highly illegal. Um, usually we feel like nobody can see us on the internet. I'm behind my computer. False. A lot of people are watching with blue team tools. And they if get you get paid caught, a lot of money to do it. yeah, a lot of legislation is in place and a lot of people fear this idea of hackers are going to get me because people are getting God all the time. So mm -hmm. caution, be careful. So all those tools we mentioned, just forget about it. Uh, <laughs> in, in reality, you'll come across what you need as you need it. Right. Uh, but there are some concepts more that that you should really try to get into, from our perspective at least. It, it, this is this is what helped us. Uh, it's what we still use today. Um, some some prereqs. I think that a person who is in information security should be pretty well versed at the command line at a Linux distro of choice. Um, uh, specifically, we're going to talk about a few different uh, tools, a few different ISOs that will create these virtual machines. If you're unaware of what those are, we'll talk about those you know, briefly. Um, but look at these tools, look them up. Uh, these are free things that you can download uh, and they will get you going. Um, again, these are some links to how to really get practice at the command line, even if you don't even have it set up just yet. Um, and, and basically these aren't specifically related to InfoSec directly. They're related to, to all things IT, especially like coding right. or anything like that. But they will be very, very, very valuable in InfoSec. So virtual machines. If you want to set up a lab at home, highly recommend virtual machines. Does everyone in here, anyone not know what virtual machines are? Never heard of them. Well, that's a, a loaded question. It is a loaded question. Who all knows what virtual machines are? This is where, you there know, we a go. crowd of hands, you can't right. see the ones aren't up. So, so virtual <laughs> machines, if you're fairly new, virtual machines, you're basically just running machines within machines. Uh, so yeah, we don't really need yeah, to it's as obvious <laughs> go as that. too deep it's, into that. No, that's, that's all there is to it. <laughs> you all get yeah. it, right? This okay. is a, a host machine that, you know, some, some guy on a host machine, he's like, hey, I want to have this Windows VM virtual machine up because I want to do some zany things against this Windows VM because Windows is more likely to be vulnerable to whatever. And so they spin up a, a virtual machine and maybe they have this attacker VM as well to test against. They don't have to have multiple machines to do this. They do it all within their main host device. A few flavors of Linux that will get you going is go ahead and download uh, just a basic Ubuntu desktop. Uh, and so you'll download an ISO and you'll make a VM. Again, Google all that. But it'll be a basic way to get to a terminal, an actual terminal that you can mess around with. Uh, after you get kind of familiar with that and how to install this stuff, download Kali and Security Onion. If you're unsure if you want to do Red or Blue Team, Go ahead and start and try doing both things. Absolutely. Like figure out the you know a few of the, the commonly used tools here and a few commonly used tools there and get going. Uh, eventually, you'll feel very comfortable at the terminal. Uh, this uh, is is pretty pretty important here. Like it seems like I you know oh funny GIF. It's great. You literally have unlimited power at the terminal, uh, and so you have people who are like, well, can't you do this in Excel? Well, no, you can't do all this stuff in Excel, right? I, I heard some some face palms. It's good. Um, in Linux, you'll use grep, sed, and awk, and some other stuff, but a lot of grep, sed, and awk, and you'll script those together, and in the end, you'll say, hey, I actually am, I have unlimited power to some degree, like where if you learn these things to uh, to the extent, you can literally do anything. So... It's, Anybody questions? It's not bad, right? Yeah, any questions, <laughs> any questions at all. We want to try to make it to where we can open up questions in the middle. Okay. Okay, no questions. It's good. Everyone gets it. So networking. Before you get started, uh, it is a good idea to have a good idea about how networks function, how they work. So just understanding the basics, um, playing around. Uh, there's so much hardware available. You can literally go to Goodwill and buy routers. eBay, uh, Goodwill, whatever. eBay. There's so many resources available. Um, a lot of schools. Um, there's a lot of people that donate. Yeah. If you need some hardware, please just reach out to us. If you want to play with yeah, we'll uh, find a way to basic get you some networking. hardware. If, yeah, it's, routing if we're loaning switches. it or whatever, we'll find a way. Yeah, get you um, a setup at home so you can play around and you know monitor your own traffic. But for now, you can download Wireshark on your PC. If you, know, if you don't start with VMs or anything, on your Windows box, on whatever box you have, you can download Wireshark and start monitoring your own traffic. And we'll show you just an example of what that looks like. Uh, if you really want to learn more about Wireshark, uh, get Practical Pack Analysis version 3 
There's the author right back there. Uh, yeah, we will give away one of these today. It literally will get you started and basically ended in, in the basics of security monitoring and the advanced stuff in security monitoring and the command line stuff in security monitoring or in the it was the analysis. first security book i ever read no yeah. joke it's and not technically a security was, book so but well, it literally has tons of security examples regular examples absolutely. it fits everybody i was on a cruise not long ago and reading this like if it's that good that you do it on a cruise you're like man i want to read that book i highly recommend it <laughs> right thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so full packet captures, uh, we're talking about the full recordings of things, getting all this network traffic. Basically, we have all these tools that just gather it up. And again, Wireshark can do it. There are command line tools that can do it. You can automate it. You can do all kinds of stuff. But in the end, it's pulling mostly the same thing, which is a full recording of everything you do on a network. Uh, there are tools when the network traffic is too much that you make metadata out of this stuff. Or you make just connection records out of this stuff like a full recording of a phone call versus just your little connection things that uh, I guess right. your uh, phone record that they mail you give, say. Yeah. Uh, and then there are things that pull out just interesting stuff this is Wireshark this is what it looks like uh, generally this is meant to be an intimidating screenshot although <laughs> once you get to, to learning see. yeah it's <laughs> less intimidating than TCP dump or something like that but once you get to learning uh, Wireshark there's all kinds of statistical tools things like that uh, you can get it to do basically whatever you want to with packets. Right. And again, if that's too much information, there are tools that just pull metadata from mm -hmm. that data so you get a better view of what you're actually searching we'll for. We'll describe those a little bit in this blue team bit. Um, blue team work. It's basically surveillance uh, mostly. Um, here is Security Onion. Security Onion is basically a big wrapped up uh, ISO, a Linux distribution with all of these blue team tools when I showed you the little graph, basically on one side of that graph were a bunch of tools that are included in Security Onion. So you don't have to really install any of this stuff. There's no challenge to getting it running. If you can get Security Onion running in a VM, you can do this. Uh, all the tools are open source within Security Onion. Uh, you can you basically reach out and ask for help on something. If there's a bug or whatever, you're probably going to get the tool author who comes back directly to you and is like, hey, you didn't try this, come on. Uh, but sometimes they'll be very helpful. Uh, it has a lot of graphical tools, a lot of command line tools. Um, you can basically do everything that you'll do in Blue Team work, you'll do here. Here's an example of pulling some of that metadata. So right in here, it looks like a lot of text, but pay attention to what's actually on here uh, that there's laser works. It does work. Oh, not there. Um, it's a TV. Uh, basically, I'm pulling all of the images that uh, this person browsed to uh, on this lowcostusa.com and photobucket.com where basically I just said, hey, print everything out, but then just show me the JPEGs. And you'll have the top right here, this grep JPEG. Again, I said grep said knock. I just said, hey, show me the JPEGs that are at the end of this. Uh, and so these are the files that this person actually went to. Uh, the silk output here doesn't make any sense in this context, but this is an example of all those connection records that in huge networks, you can easily pull stats on who is the you know the busiest talkers, what guys talking out to China a bunch, uh, you know any kind of thing that you want. So again, that's metadata that's basically pulled from the full packet capture. So data you can see all data. of these things in Wireshark, but you have to really filter it down. So and on the fly, this is the the faster way to do it right. on like large networks, large captures. Uh, this is an example of network miner. I just put a PCAP in and out came all these pictures and credentials and all kinds of stuff. As you can see in the tab at the top, uh, this is a little coffin I built. I uh, put wheels on it and uh, uh, it hasn't worked yet, but uh, as in it hasn't killed me yet. I'll sell it to you. We'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> Network security monitoring is collection detection analysis. To wrap it up in a really summarized way, collection, you collect all this stuff. Uh, detection, there are a lot of tools to bring out alerts and things like that. And then analysis, you actually do human, you know, hands-on stuff and interpret that for other people. Uh, the whole process here, there are a lot of different tools used for these things. Uh, specifically, like things like Sword and Suricata, they alert on stuff. You say, this is what a, a signature of what something bad looks like. It's going to look at all your data all the time and say, oh, I found that signature. Here's an alert for it. Maybe you should check it out. 
uh, bro again it's data about data but can be used for detection as well mm -hmm. and then analysis there are all kinds of different graphical tools that you can parse through all this data I'll show you some examples in just a little bit right. um, when we do a red team blue team example and again those are all packaged into security onion so you don't have to download and install them all which is very nice red team tools so we have a different set of tools some tools we share with blue team but we have a specific Operating system we use, which is called Kali Linux. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of Kali Linux. Um, like Security Onion, Kali Linux is just prepackaged with all of the common pen testing tools. They're all built in. Again, one more warning. Please, please, please do this in a lab environment. Don't just go testing your bank yeah. online. Even if you think you have permission, do you don't always have permission from right. all parties either. Uh, you may have someone at you know, right. your cousin's company, and he's like, oh, yeah, you could do that here. No, that doesn't you need mean written you approval, right. right? Even if you are in an engagement with a client and they've given you a range of IPs and they're like, yeah, we want you to, you know, test these ranges, and you've compromised that, and you can go to a whole other subnet. No, you Double can't. Verified. They didn't give you permission. Don't do that. So it's just easier <laughs> so to learn this stuff on your own in, mm -hmm. in VMs and stuff. Uh, the same goes with the blue team monitoring before. You really don't want to see what your friends and family are browsing to on the internet. And when you accidentally start monitoring them, you're like, hey, this, this is not a bad idea. It's harmless. It's passive. It's not so harmless uh, to you because you're like, oh, yeah, you're like, I now know them very personally. Um, again, these are, yes, yeah, some examples. There are many warnings out there. You can't possibly do this stuff without seeing these warnings. Heed all of them. Uh, I mean, you have uh, Aaron Schwartz isn't the best example of, you know, a hacker or anything like that. But he is a good example of where the law really hammered down on a guy uh, based on a tons of, you know, tons of different laws that they tried to, to put on him. In the end, they went through a bunch of legal proceedings, thought it was going to be nice and fine. He tried to make a, a plea agreement. They said no, so he hanged himself. He's dead now. Uh, and, and all because he, he wasn't even doing the stuff that we're talking about today, which in a minute, we'll be like physically, or not physically attacking somebody, but Please it's basically they perceive me. it that way. You have, in, in the end, they will crash right. down on you very hard. And again, people are paid to watch this stuff. So what is a great way for you to set up something at home and practice? Uh, well, we highly recommend if you want to be a red team person, knowing the blue team side as well. So downloading both Kali and Security Onion. Uh, Metasploitable 2 is... Basically, just another um, operating system that is already vulnerable. You just have to turn it on, and you've got an operating system that has a bunch of vulnerable software ready for you to attack. You don't have to do anything; just turn it on. Um, so you can, you know, try try attacking it from your Kali box. Uh, try monitoring your attack with your security onion box. So. Typical pen testing methodology. There's generally, um, you know, I've heard different methodologies, but in summary, what you're going to start with is doing, you know, a discovery or a mapping of the hosts that you're wanting to compromise. So you're going to start with like a network scan, see which hosts are out there, um, you know, what services and ports are available for you to, you know, attack. Uh, you're going to do an assessment on them. So you'll do some sort of, you know, you could do manually vulnerability scan, uh, or you could run scanners. There's lots of free uh, scanners available. Uh, then once you find what's vulnerable, you want to exploit it. Um, and there's lots of tools already on Kali Linux with exploits ready for you to fire away. And then once you've done that, you pretty much rinse and repeat. So the discovery phase. What is the discovery phase? Um, again, you're mapping what's available. Uh, let's say you're on a pen test. Uh, you know, they've given you an IP range. Uh, you're going to first want to say, who's home? You know, uh, what's out there? What's available for me to attack? So you're going to run probably an in-map scan. In-map is one of the most common tools I know of. Uh, it stands for network mapper. Um, so basically what you see in this slide, uh, we're scanning a range, and we're seeing that there are four hosts that report back and say, we're live on the network, we're turned on, we're home. It's basically just uh, rattling some windows to see... Uh you know, who is actually home in here, maybe peeking through and, and seeing what you can do. There are more invasive things that you can do to, to test this, uh, but this is just a very basic thing. If you're on your home network and it's all trusted and uh, you have everyone's permission, you know, scanning your home network is something that will reveal what hosts mm -hmm. are actually up in most cases. 
Um, so here we did another in-map scan where we basically just said, hey, uh, we see that this one host is up. Scan this host. Tell us what services are turned on, what's running. Uh, and in-map can go so far as to guess what version of a service is running. Uh, we highlighted this FTP service at the top. Uh, that's VS FPT D 2.3.4. Uh, so that's going to follow through in our example. So just note there that... You know, we scanned that host, we saw that that service was open, and that's an older version of that FTP server. If you saw this amount of services on a device in your house, you probably should be suspicious as well. This is, again, <laughs> a, uh, a vulnerable host uh, that we've mm -hmm. set up. Um, so it was made for the purpose of doing some sort of uh, investigation on and testing against. So now that we've discovered what's there, we've mapped it out, we know who's home, we know what's running, let's do an assessment. Um, OpenVos is a vulnerability scanner, and you can basically just set it up. It's on Kali Linux, of course. Uh, you can put in the IP address, and it will run through and do kind of an invasive assessment for you. And never mind the cartoons. So yeah, we, don't let that fool you. It's, we it's a decent free. tool. <laughs> uh, a lot of people use uh, tools like Nessus and a few other tools like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Many of those have gotten uh, very, very commercial over time uh, because they're all quite good. Um, but OpenVos is still completely free. Mm -hmm. um, the cartoons may seem like it's lighthearted, but it is very serious um, and will, will very much help you out on compromising hosts. So here's a result from this scan uh, for that host. Um, I think you can, did we highlight the... There should be a finding for the FTP server on here. Yeah, uh, but basically, you know, it spits out a result saying, hey, here's what... Here's what OpenVos found. These are the services that we found are running. Here's how severe this exploit is. Um, it gives you a guess at how likely they think their test was to be accurate. Uh, so we found a, where is it at? It's about uh, a little uh, lower. Okay, than yeah, it it's was. kind of in the mid screen, but it says, hey, we think there's a 99% chance that this is actually a legitimate thing that we can exploit. Um, if you click into that, again, it tells you this is what we found. Um, it's this version and it's affected. Uh, there's an exploit available. There's references at the bottom, so you can go study about why that was vulnerable. Please do each time. Absolutely. Uh, they won't make sense at first, um, but over time, these things will make more and more sense. You'll see that they're more and more common. Uh, it's like, oh, well, you know, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, this vulnerability, uh, you know, figure out what the terminology is. And you can't really well, see that, that at all. <laughs> okay. Well, basically, we're moving on to the exploitation phase. So now we found our vulnerability, uh, and now we want to exploit it. Uh, we know that it's vulnerable. Uh, Metasploit is, as everyone pretty much heard of Metasploit, Okay, so Metasploit, this is MSF console, which is just like the interface to Metasploit um, on the command line. Uh, there we go. So basically we power it up and we say, hey, let's search through your database and tell me if you already have an exploit built for me because I don't know how to create malware yet, I'm just starting. Tell me if you have an exploit in here. So we search through and sure enough, there's a, an exploit already saved in its database, ready. All you have to do is tailor it to your host that you want to attack. To summarize, Metasploit is an exploitation framework that uh, right. you can kick up and chances are it's probably going to have something for most things that OpenVos is going to report back to you. Especially if it's like a high risk, you know, 99% chance it's vulnerable, you're probably going to find something in uh, in Metasploit for it. Uh, even if it's a pretty modern, I mean, you, you will be able to find it online or be able to load it in. So now we exploit it. So here we go, uh, we've selected our exploit, we tailor it to fit the IP address that we're attacking, it runs the exploit, we see some FTP commands, and then bottom line we see that we have a command shell session opened uh, between their host and ours, so we have command line access to that host. Uh, we run the ID command and it tells us that we have the privilege of root user, so we have root level access on that box. So basically you, you've won uh, for, for that box. Um, so, Victory! So, so, yeah, celebration, right? But, but not so fast. Um, because it's not so easy if you are actually a bad guy and you're like, hey, I'm gonna use the, all these tricks for money and go rob people, basically. Because just the exploit alone, uh, which was about three lines, you typed about three lines, uh, still made 14 events. Um, so the attack, or the, the blue team guy or gal who was watching, uh, suddenly was like, oh, okay. I see what's going on here. 
we have that uh, honeypot or that vulnerable host that we put out there on our network. Somebody compromised that. Uh, let's let's see what's going on here. And they were they were also internal, which is uh, would be a fun day for that person. Uh, they would love that. <laughs> like, oh, let's put the hammer down. Um, but even more so, it was only after you made a lot more alerts with your scan. Right. Your scan was very, very, very loud. This is just one page of these. I don't expect you to read everything, but your scan looked for all kinds of vulnerabilities. And as it looks for those, a lot of those are very, very invasive that, that we will see those on the network uh, to the point where just your, uh, your user agent, you know, your identifier that is open VOS, uh, we saw that at least 50,000 times. Uh, so Very there nice. were there were roughly a hundred thousand alerts in total uh, that we saw these that just showed up here. So your your scan, which seemed benign, and your mm -hmm. your exploitation that seemed easy, actually generated over a hundred thousand alerts. And and someone got probably mad on the blue team. They're like, oh god, this guy, he, he's so many alerts. We have to close out now. This is ridiculous. So <laughs> in conclusion, you know it's. It didn't seem all that bad, right? There, there's a lot to learn, but it's pretty structured once you once you have a focus. Right. It's all quite fun um, once you get used to it. At first, it may seem overburdening. It may seem like it's very difficult, especially if you're alone in learning it. But you're not alone in learning it if you'll reach out to people. Like, don't feel so so shy that you can't reach out to people online or in person. Uh, people give talks like this quite a bit at different conferences, different B sides if you just reach out to them. So for instance, I'll be in the fishbowl for a while, the room's down here. Uh, I'll be with the Rural Technology Fund talking about some stuff. If you want to know more about some of the stuff you don't already know, come talk to me. I may not know what I'm talking about on what you ask me. I may know a lot. I'll definitely be able to reference you to something and reference you to somebody. Um, to summarize, the blue team stuff is collection detection analysis. We do surveillance work and then we try to detect bad stuff. We don't care about monitoring good stuff for the most part outside of knowing what is a critical asset or what is a very valuable thing on the network. We care about that stuff because we want to defend against it, uh, anything attacking all that. Um, we do detection based on those alerting. Uh, that, that's what actually catches the baddies. But then you have 100,000 alerts to go through or we do analysis and we say, this was the actual exploitation. Again, 100,000 alerts, only 14 of those made up an actual exploit that compromised the host. So it's a matter of verifying that there was a compromised host, not just a scanned host. Because on the internet, if you're exposed to the internet, everyone is scanning you all the time. So red team people, again, we're doing the opposite, but what we're doing is to support and help companies, not because we want to just feel good about our pen testing skills. Um, you know, you're wanting to help the company by testing the resources that they gave you permission to test. Uh, you're wanting to do that as quietly as possible so that blue team doesn't detect you because, you know, we want to mimic what a legitimate attacker would do. Um, you know, most attacks, you know, people have months and years to work on breaking into something, whereas when you have a pen test, you may just have a week or two to do your job. So you want to do the best job you can, um, be very thorough. Um, so, you know, again, the, the methodology of discovering, you know, what, what's out there, what do they have. I've tested some companies that, you know, were like, hey, we see you have all this stuff running, and they're like, we didn't know about that. Every company will so be again, like that. So again, like, <laughs> even that phase is very important. You know, what do you see running, um, and being very thorough about that, um, doing a good assessment of it, uh, what's vulnerable. Some companies don't want you to exploit things. They just want you to do a really good vulnerability scan, um, and then tell them, hey, you know, here's what we found, here's what's vulnerable, you need to patch these things, we don't actually know how severe they are or if they can be exploited, so maybe you stop there. Then other people do want you to go ahead and say, we really want to prove to the guys upstairs that this is bad stuff, so make this as bad as you can, exploit everything, own our network, show how bad this could really get, um, and that helps, you know, usually the security team get funding for more tools and for detection. You're given so, that scope. Right, you so, don't f figure it out on your own and be like, I'm going right. to own everybody. They give you a scope right. and you, you stick to that. Again, it goes about permission. Even when you have right. permission, don't go too crazy. Um, so, uh, and I guess lastly, the other stuff here is that, you know, I talk about compliance administration briefly in the beginning. And even though we aren't doing compliance or administration, we know a ton of people who are. 
uh, they, they do keep everything running. They are the ones who are actually uh, trying to reduce that attack surface all the time. Uh, right. They're keeping your company legal. They're keeping your security department intact. Um, they are, uh, while we talked about operations, this, I mean, they're, you could talk for days on compliance and days on administration. Absolutely. And I think the main point is that everybody's trying to work together. You know, like, yeah, Red Team's really cool. It's kind of portrayed as the sexier side of security because you know, you're a hacker and it's so cool. But but Blue Team is just as important. And you know, I've I've played both roles so far, and I can honestly say that by being a Red Team person, it's made me much better as a Blue Team person now. When I see a scan, I'm like, guys, we need to pay attention to this. Like, you know, I I kind of have. You know, you can kind of see both roles. So, you know, I think that's important. They're the same coin, just two sides of it. Um, and the main goal is to protect data. So, so how do you actually get a job doing this? Um, you don't want to go into interviews and feel very nervous because you don't know anything. Um, you can't expect, in most cases, to get a job and then start learning. Uh, that's the thing about information security is that there are few jobs available to people who are not are not currently skilled uh, and a lot of times when a place is hiring it's because they have no one or they have no one skilled currently so don't expect to even go to a place if you get that job and be able to easily learn your key is actually taking it and trying to make a passion out of it and a lot of times again that comes to knowing somebody else and trying to like bring people together to maybe learn it with you because it's so much easier to stay on it if you do that um, certs, they're great, but they'll get, and they'll get you through the door to an interview, right. but don't rely on a cert. Don't think that you can say, oh, well, I could either learn this on my own for, you know, weeks and months at a time, or I could do this week course and be done. Like, it takes more than a week to learn this stuff. And, uh, usually people anyways don't have the money for those week courses when they start out because they're not actually in a job anyways. So get experience. To add on to what he was saying about like, you know, when you're researching jobs, you know, and they, they have like 15 to 20 bullets of we want somebody that can do this, 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 and this. I've interviewed for many roles where I looked, I maybe only knew like three to five of those bullets that I felt like I'm moderately confident I can talk about these things. And that's okay. Most people just, you know, a lot of people are posting because they want a superstar that can do everything. But that doesn't mean that they don't want someone that can do five of those things really well. They understand. I feel like our community knows, like, it's really hard to find somebody that just knows all of it. There's way too much to know. And I, you know, I do think the community is very understanding. So don't let that hold you back from applying to jobs that are interesting to you because you will get there. It just takes time to get up that learning curve. And maybe most importantly, uh, it's, it's good to make this a career if you really jump into it and spend all this time, especially if you're in a job and you have to learn this after work and you're spending nights and stuff. Just make it, make it a career. Start going to, you're already here, so it's already a good sign. Uh, but contribute at B-sides, things like that. They always need help. Uh, you know, if you like to code, take on a security project. That's a great way to re get really interested and get other people interested in you. Uh, in the community as well. Uh, and once you, you know, you grow forward, maybe either contribute or start a technical blog. Maybe nobody will read it, but you will have been blogging things and actually later on down the road, you'll be able to look back and be like, I remember when I was doing that and it'll be good. So. Questions, anybody? Yes. Oh. Uh, so yeah, I mean they're all on libpcap specifically. Uh, that's a good question. What do you think, Chris? You had a question? So the question was, if you are a hacker and is a, if a blue team person, can they find you uh, based on IP? Uh, so this can actually be, this will be a fun political question. So we talk about Russia, things like that. So all these hackers, you know, hacking campaigns here and there and that and the other. It's quite challenging sometimes if you're a very, very skilled attacker, 
uh, it'll, be, it'll be challenging for a blue team person to guarantee with 100% accuracy that yes, this person is from Russia. That they didn't, like you said, you said scramble. Well, a lot of people, what they do is they proxy around. So I may be in the U.S., like I may be right here, and I may you know, buy some proxy, which means I route my traffic basically through another place, and then through another place, and then I attack from there. Well, from most blue teamers' perspectives, especially if you don't have access to a ton of intel or a ton of connections right. you know, outside of some very large organizations, it's going to be hard for the random person to be like, oh, I bet that actually they were here because it, it's going to look like Russia. It's going to look like Ukraine right. or somewhere like that. So, yeah, right. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's... Uh, it's very hard to confirm if the source that you're seeing is actually that source. Yeah. But the good news yeah. from the blue team perspective is that not everyone is that smart. Um, and a lot of places, as far as like running those down, it's still not necessarily, like, if your question is actually, can I actually do this and make some money by proxying through Ukraine? Maybe for a while, but I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> in a pen testing like engagement where you know a company's paid you to come in, usually all of the pen testers will give the company, like like I was testing from my house, so I just gave them my home IP address. That way, the blue team, like usually they won't tell, you know, the blue team people that a pen test is happening. They'll wait and see if they catch it. But normally, like, we'll go ahead and give somebody our IP addresses. When they do detect it, they have a way to say, okay, well, let's confirm that's not a legitimate attack. Okay, yeah, we paid this company to come in. You know, that way they know that it was, you know, something they, they asked for, not, not a true attack on their environment. <laughs> How often would it come up that you're dealing with production servers in work? So hopefully it is rare that you're actually doing <laughs> Absolutely. that. Absolutely. In theory, yeah, you should not be doing that very often. But I So from a detection sometimes. perspective, you should always be monitoring things in production. Oh, that's a good point. Um, yeah. From a pen testing perspective, um, it depends on what it is. Um, you know, when you exploit things, sometimes we take servers down. Um, we may request uh, that they, you know, use something that's in their QA environment so that, you know, they'll just, you know, make a, a backup copy and let us attack that. It really depends on what the resource is and how important it is. You know, if or we've had companies that request, hey, we want you to do a big vulnerability scan. But sometimes that can <laughs> hurt the bandwidth or really take, you know, take them offline. So they may request we do that at nighttime. Uh, so that way they have time to recover if there's an issue. Yeah. Well, right, right, so yeah. all of those things in a pen test, they are very, very thorough. Like, you know, they talk back and forth. They get a very clear line of what are what is our scope of our engagement, and we do not go outside of that scope. Yeah. But that's a consulting pen test company, mm -hmm. too, that they do this all the time. There are some companies who have, like, one red team guy, and maybe it's, uh, you know, this person has, like, just started learning or something like that, and they're like, hey, can you do a vulnerability test against all of our stuff? And maybe it's a bunch of old legacy things. And next thing you know, they're bringing down some sort of network equipment. Like, I don't know how this happened. Of course you don't. You just started. Like, you, you really can't be expected <laughs> to know. Yeah. But, like, yeah, so it's, it's on the company sometimes to know the stuff. Right. But, again, it, it comes down it to, happens, like, not many it, companies yeah. have that knowledge. So that's why a lot of times they go yeah. to consulting companies because, I mean, these are companies that are entirely made up of people who know this stuff. Right. You know, we tried to, but all of his blue shirts, like the sinners were like wrinkled funny. And, he, and I was like, that's wrinkled funny. He's like, all my shirts are like this. Yeah, like, I work from home. So we need to like, get you some more shirts, bro. like bro. dress clothes. I, what is this? It's just, they're all wrinkled. Yeah. It's, well, okay. Yeah. Wear some like <laughs> linen or something. It's naturally wrinkly. So. Yes. Okay, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, that's true. You just got to be careful about the stuff that you don't know that you don't know. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Be honest with yourself, too, on that. Though. Sometimes an inexperienced security person is better and sometimes worse than no security person. Absolutely. Good point. Yeah. How will they learn? <laughs> No more, else? There's no more questions. Yeah, we will handles. give away some stuff. Yeah. Okay, so I'll be I'll be um, the Price is Right uh, show person here. Okay. I don't. I guess we need this now. I guess we don't. 
Tell them what we have. No, let me hold it. Oh, I'll be the Vanna. <laughs> da -da. Okay. So this is Practical Packet Analysis by Chris Sanders. This is version three. It is flawless. Um, <laughs> That's right. Uh, it comes with a Rural Technology Fund card in here because they are the ones who have uh, pushed this forward. Rural Technology Fund, again, you've already heard me probably before this talk, but they are an organization, a nonprofit, that goes around and making sure, they make sure that rural schools and rural areas have the opportunities, or at least close to the opportunities, that uh, more urban schools have. Uh, a lot of urban schools have tons of funding, uh, sometimes too much funding that they, they don't even know what to do with. This is a means of giving rural areas uh, you know, 3D printers and, uh, you know, labs of Chromebooks and things like that. Raspberry Pis. Yeah, like Raspberry Pis, mm -hmm. if they have a need, uh, especially if it's a need for like a dispersed classroom, chances are the Rural Technology Fund can provide, especially if they reach out. Uh, there's means of reaching out to the Rural Technology Fund if you're with a rural school or something like that. Uh, and there's a, a means of recommending, you can reach out directly to them. Uh, and, and they will uh, hopefully provide if they can. I think last year they, they uh, uh, impacted 10,000 children, uh, and this year they are already, what is the number probably already at? Uh, 12,000 already. 12,000 already. So, uh, and this is, um, it's, it's on behalf of Chris Sanders. Again, he, he runs the Rural Technology Fund and, and really puts in a ton of work on it uh, to the point that um, he also has, again, the Rural Technology Fund has a, a booth as well over in the fishbowl, uh, it's not just a giveaway there for another copy of this, but they're also giving away classes uh, for um, uh, his his training program, which uh, you can go see him again immediately after this, and he'll talk to you all about it. But it's about fifteen hundred dollars worth of uh, worth of stuff. It's a silent auction over there, uh, so chances are uh, you can probably grab up an eight an eight hundred dollar packet analysis class uh, for well less than eight hundred dollars probably. Um, but uh, I highly recommend you go there uh, as, as soon as possible, whenever you can. But, but the for book, now, yeah, the for book now. is what we're giving away, and the book is really <laughs> awesome. Um, again, this is one of the first books that I started with. It's how do I use Wireshark? How do I capture, you know, PCAP? What is in? What does all this stuff mean? And it breaks it down. Chris is an excellent teacher. He has excellent humor in the book. Um, he's from Kentucky, and maybe just because I know your voice as I read it, I can like hear you. But it's it's true. But his, like it's like his accent is in the book. But I, it's an excellent book. So I do. So recommend preferably, it. this this goes to someone who is fairly fresh to infosec, since that's what this talk is geared at. Um, of the people fairly fresh to infosec. Youngest person. Mm, oh, trivia question. This is a hard one. I don't expect an answer. What is one of the detection tools for blue team work? Actually, any of them. Are you new to InfoSec? I'm new to InfoSec. What is one of the things? Snort. Snort. You win a copy of Practical Packet Analysis. Congratulations! <laughs> Your keynote speaker, the Defensive Security Handbook, which was recently released, and a lot of other goodies that you will have to discover once you win this. Do you have another trivia question? No. You don't okay. have a trivia question. I didn't, you didn't tell me to prepare for that. I did not prepare either. Um, so it wasn't in your scope. It wasn't in my scope. That's right. <laughs> Good Thank point. You. Yeah. He gets me. That probably could have been the trivia question. What is the most important thing that you should do before you do any of these activities? Oh, you're the first. Are you new to InfoSec? I, I don't know if I said new to InfoSec. My hands up. Who said what? I said Are y'all together? No. Okay. I feel like everything going to the same house would be somehow wrong. No, we, we all pretty took the same Cisco routers class. Cisco people as well taking Cisco classes. Yes. Uh, okay, my pulling on my heartstrings. Uh, <laughs> Cisco's watching this at least. Uh, uh, so okay, well we appreciate everything. Uh, again, please make it over to the RTF booth and uh, have a good day. If anyone has questions yeah. about jobs, come talk to us. We'd be happy Absolutely. to tell you about those roles. All right, thank, thank you, you very much.